Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL and SWIC podcast. I'm Scott Williams, your host, and today we have with us Andrew Dow, who's a retired SEAL and also our officer programs expert. And we thought we, today we'd just take a look inside the mailbag. We get a lot of questions um, about officer accession programs and in particular about what we call SOAS, which is the SEAL officer accession and selection. And maybe, Andrew, you can just start by giving us kind of a synopsis of what SOAS is. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me again, guys. Um, what SOAS is, the SEAL officer assessment selection uh, was developed in 2014, and it has now become an official program for the Navy, a uh, prerequisite for BUDS, basic underwater demolition seals uh, and it's a two week long course where we assess officer candidates whether they're coming from the naval academy rotc ocs candidates lateral transfers so candidates from the Na big navy active duty and it's a two week course of instruction during the summer where we will assess specifically four uh, attributes that we're looking at one being their cognitive abilities their character which is a real important one um their leadership and their team ability that's what we're looking at with those four main attributes um, they will go through a week of physical and mental assessment evolutions where we'll be, we'll be testing them through their physical capabilities as well as presenting them with uh, some mental challenges that they'll be faced with one being it could be um you know, some evolutions they'll see are similar to what they'll see in buds, where it's log PT or boats on their heads. But they'll also be introduced to new types of evolutions that specifically assesses their those four big traits. Um, and then the second week being interview week, where they will sit down with an officer and a senior enlisted SEAL in the community. And they will sit down and it's, it's a business interview where they'll, where they'll be asked questions and regarding the community, regarding where they stand and how they were raised, challenges they faced, and to get a good idea of what the individual, who the individual is. And all of this gets thrown together and goes to the selection panel, which happens after SOAS. And just to be clear, this is not for enlisted candidates. It's for officer candidates only. Yes. And when does SOAS occur during the, the assessment pathway? So... SOAS happens during the summer, and it happens, um, like I said, two weeks in June, two weeks in July, two weeks in August. And this happens after applications have been submitted to the SEAL Officer Community Manager. And correct, like you said, it's only for SEAL officer candidates. The enlisted side is completely separate. Uh, those applications are due in February to the SEAL OCM. And from there, it's a they find out if they receive an invitation to SOAS, they complete SOAS, then the SEAL selection panel, which is a panel of 0506 SEAL officers that determine who will receive orders to BUDS. After that, pretty much a month, two months after, depending which accession source you'll be, you will head off to BUDS. Okay, so it's definitely pre-BUDS. Yes. And it's after the application piece, um, you get a notification if you're invited. You come here during the summer, and then you get notified um, if you're going to attend BUDS. And that notification usually comes when? So selection panel September. Most candidates, specifically OCS, will be notified late October. ROTC, OC, ROTC and Naval Academy will since they're rising seniors, they won't find out until about December time frame because they won't actually go to BUDS until the summer of, you know, past graduation. But OCS candidates can leave any time between uh, November to April where they would first have to attend OCS in Newport, Rhode Island for 12 weeks. And then a month after that, they will report to BUDS. So they could get to BUDS as early as January, February after the selection panel and be at BUDS getting after it. So we're talking about a good year, year and a half process from Easy, deadline easily, of application yes. to actually showing up for BUDS if you're easily. selected. Yeah. Uh, on av uh, 
most candidates about it's about a two year cycle. Uh, OCS, it's a little sooner because they already have their degree, mm -hmm. right? To become a, a naval officer yeah. or any officer, you have to have your at least a four year degree to earn your commission. Yeah. So they will. It's usually about two years. So much longer timeline than a guy going for an enlisted contract. Absolutely. Who could I mean even show up a month after? Right after he, he gets contract. a contract, but but usually more <clears throat> like three to six months, but way longer for officer candidates. So this is why it's good to apply when you're in your junior year. Yes. So I, I actually, it's a great question. Is most candidates, I start trying to reach out to them their freshman, sophomore year in college, just so they have an idea. And so they have all their answers, all their questions answered well before they actually submit an application. So they can, you know, start building their resume. But usually um, candidates start their application, whether it's ROTC, Naval Academy in June, uh, excuse me, their junior year. OCS candidates usually are either graduated already but or about to graduate that May. So they'll start their application usually August for a February deadline. Okay, so we have a lot of questions um, that people out there have sent to us. And by the way, b before we get into those, I'll just say uh, if you have questions about SOAS, about SEAL officer programs in general, or whether you have questions about the SEAL community, even if you want to be enlisted, or the SWIC community, if you want to be an enlisted SWIC. Andrew, how can they get a hold of us? Well, for the SEAL officer side, they can uh, just go to Google. SEALSWIC.com is a great resource to uh, find all things SEAL officer requirements, as well as the enlisted side for both SEAL and SWIC. Um, but my contact information is there on that website. Um, that's probably the easiest way to find out more about it and from there i can get you on the seal e email distro which will which is an opportunity for C aspiring seal candidates to come together and i send announcements out regarding uh, upcoming events for specifically for seal officers so it's a uh it's a good resource to have just going to sealswick.com is where you start Right. SealSwick.com is our home website. It's where all the information is, where you can find out about training, about accession, and a lot of other things about the community. And our general email there, which actually comes to me, and so I can send things over to Andrew or whoever I need to to get answers if I don't know it, is info at SealSwick.com. Info at SealSwick.com for all your questions. So we're going to do a few today. Uh, we have so many here, we'll probably schedule you for another session and we'll, we'll answer some more. But all of these questions that we're about to cover are about SOAS. So I'm going to kind of randomly throw some of these out of here, reach into my mailbag. Okay. I totally faked that. And, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to have some questions. So, all right. How about this one? Uh, will knowing a second language help with my SOAS package? If so, what languages should I learn? All right. So, Languages in general is a good quality, a good capability to have when you're looking in the SEAL community. SF requires all their operators to learn a language. Um, the SEAL community does not, but it's always a good tool to have when it comes down to it. Uh, specifically for the SOAS application, it is not a requirement. Um, it's a nice to have, specifically languages that seals are operating in um, you can just check out the news where are their major conflicts going on those areas and the the regions that um, there could potentially be um, presence military presence are a good spot to start learning what language you could potentially learn however it is not going to get you to SOAS. Um, it's a good thing to have it's a nice resume booster but it is not the thing that is a requirement. Could it separate you from the pack? It can, it can and you know, from, from experience, guys who, guys and gals that speak a language um, are more in tune to learn another language. You know, they can learn multiple languages and that can be very, a very powerful tool within the community, being able to speak multiple languages. Um, I think having a good understanding, not just a basic understanding, but a working knowledge of yeah. this language, of a specific language will definitely help you in the end. But it, I mean, this is just such a small part 
before going to seals, before going to buds, before going to soas. I mean, it's good to have, but it's not necessary. However, it doesn't hurt. So languages like, you know, the big ones most people take if they're doing any type of major is whether it's Spanish, French, German. Um, but obviously some of the big ones were no longer in Iraq and Afghanistan. So the, the Arabic language and all their dialects isn't as... Um, not quite as immediate use as it right, used to be, right? Right, but, but I mean, being able to speak any of those languages is puts you above everyone else, and it will definitely, um, definitely jump out on the application, seeing that you can speak any of those dialects. Well, considering that we have SEALs and SWIC in more than 100 countries around the world, um, there's, there's plenty to choose from. Um, I guess we would strongly encourage English, <laughs> I would hope so. Um, that's an important language. Yeah. And, you know. Portuguese, um, you know, you got to think about where we could possibly be in the world, right? Um, so uh, French and Spanish are widely sp spoken languages around the world. Dutch, um, Portuguese, Chinese, Russian, you know, the usual, um, the usual candidates. So. It's a good thing to have. It's not a requirement. It, no, not it's not a requirement, a but it's a nice language. to have, and it and it won't hurt. Right. Um, but don't let that. If you have to choose between okay a language or having a better GPA, you want to lean towards having a better GPA. Uh, you know, academics is important when you're applying specifically for the SEAL officer route. Now, w one question I've heard before is, um, do I need to learn how to? you know, um, dive or snorkel or, you know, uh, shoot a gun before I get two butts. So, Scott, it's funny you say that. A lot of multiple classmates of mine never dove, never shot a weapon in their life before coming to buds. And they were probably some of our best shooters and best divers because they were a blank canvas and everything the instructors taught them, they absorbed and were able to do it the exact way the instructors were telling them to do it. Vice having a person who shot their whole life or dove their whole life has have all these incorrect um, habits, habits, right? Bad habits yeah. um, that are hard to fix and hard to relearn. So. You don't need to have any of that experience, right? And, you know, if you have a will to serve, a will, a will to lead, um, that's what the community is looking for. Good men and women who are willing to, you know, potentially make the ultimate sacrifice. Um, everything else will be taught to you and you'll be expected to learn it and learn it fast and learn it well. Okay, let's look at another question here. We talk about elements of the package. What does a good letter of recommendation look like? What should be included in a letter of recommendation the seal officer community manager it, we got rid of letters of recommendation they're now called letters of references so it's a templated mm. format that you can find on the seal o officer community manager page and it is it's templated so you give it to someone who you feel would write a good letter of recommendation they will complete this letter of reference and submit it along with your application it's general questions to talk about who you are as an individual who you know, what some of your goals are, your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, things that really paint a good picture about you, your character, and, you know, what you represent. And that leads into who should you get for these letters of reference. Right. Are we talking about a four-star admiral or Chuck Norris or who? Hey, if you're great friends or if your father or mother are great friends with these type of individuals and they know you personally, yeah, I would get Chuck Norris in a heartbeat. But most people don't know Chuck Norris, so or a four-star admiral. But if you do know these types of um, high-caliber people, um, yeah, it, it doesn't hurt for them to write your re letter of reference. But at the end of the day, the board, the SEAL officer uh, board, wants to see the letters of references from people who, who know you as a in a personal level, right? Whether and some people I suggest candidates get is guidance counselors, professors, coaches. Um, maybe you have uh, a family friend that served in the military. And a big question I get is, do I have to get a SEAL, like a, a right. SEAL officer or SEAL enlisted to write my letter of reference? And the answer is no. Um, it's nice to have, but at the end of the day, it's not necessary. Um, if, but if you do have someone in your family chain or in your, your network of 
people, um, I would highly uh, suggest you reach out to them and see if they're willing to write a letter of reference for you. So that, the, that will help. The point is that you don't have to go military celebrity Absolutely hopping. Not. You just... They want somebody who has true insight into right. the character of the person they're writing about. Right. Don't just search for that signature, cookie cutter signature. You know, oh, it was a four-star general who is your mother's cousin's sister's best friend's husband's friend. Yeah. Right. Just because their signature is so known, they don't know you. And that's what we're looking for. People who know you. Yeah. So probably not your local senator. Who right. Right. Just met you over mail. Correct. <laughs> right. Okay. Got it. Um, what are some common mistakes seen in SOAS candidates throughout the first week? Our readers want to know. All right. So listeners, this is sorry. a great question. Um, s- some of the things that we see candidates showing up, they're not prepared with running. And SOAS, BUDS, everywhere you go, you're running, whether it's a sprint or it's a jog. You're going from point A to point B and you're running. We have candidates showing up who are struggling just with this. And that something I suggest to all candidates is, you know, it's important that you're training not just for long distance, but short distance. So you should be a good sprinter and a good long distancer. You don't need to be a marathon runner to go to Bud's. It will help and to go to SOAS. It will be very helpful, um, but that's not... Just being able to condition and maintain a pace is what is important to get through SOAS and BUDS. You know, those guys and gals who can run, you know, three-hour marathons, yeah, that will. you'll probably make it for the running portion, but it's not going to get you through log PT. It's not going to get you through um, the ruck run specifically, which leads me to yeah. rucking. Rucking, soft sand, boots. We get these questions all the time. Should they be training like that? So I, I, I caution this because I don't want to see candidates get injured prior to coming to SOAS or BUDS. But something you will face at SOAS is rucking. And, you know, it's an unknown weight, but I'll tell you it's somewhere between 35 and 45 pounds. Everywhere you go, you'll be carrying this weight. And there may be evolutions at SOAS where you'll be an unknown distance for time to complete uh, a ruck run. So your first time wearing a rucksack with 35 to 45 pounds shouldn't be at SOAS. I would definitely prep with that, but you need to make sure you're pushing yourself to a probably an understandable limit so you don't hurt yourself because that's, that's something we don't want to see guys and gals training too hard and hurting themselves and then they underperform at SOAS. So be cautious with how you train using a ruck. There's a lot of uh, informative videos out there on how to ruck properly. People think it's just throw on a backpack and start running. No, there's actually a technique to rucking and properly. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you're going to do it on the sand. So, you know, do your research before you jump into it. Um, and, Scott, just like you said, guys and gals are not used to wearing boots. So I'm not saying strap on your boots and go run in public because some people may find that embarrassing. But I would highly suggest the first time you wear boots isn't at SOAS. You know, you yeah. at SOAS, you'll get issued a pair of boots if you need it. But I suggest to everyone, spend the $160, $180 and get yourself a good pair of boots um, that you can break in and wear to SOAS. That's authorized to do. The boot that they're utilizing at um, Bud's and... It used to be the Bates Light, but they moved away from that, and now they're using the Nike SFB um, boot in color black, non-Gore-Tex. I get this question a lot. Why non-Gore-Tex? Well, you're going to be getting wet and sandy, and you want your boot to be able to drain. A Gore-Tex boot doesn't drain well like a non-Gore-Tex boot. So Hmm. Nike SFB Generation 2 black, non-Gore-Tex boot. Um, You you can find a, a range of prices. They're expensive, but it... Once you get them broken broken in, it's like wearing running shoes. And it will definitely pay dividends in the end when you show up to SOAS prepared with a good broken in boot. So you can, you know, crush all the evolutions that require you to run on the sand. Yeah. And probably not a good idea to make your very first uh, run on the sand the first time you're also wearing boots and the first time you're carrying a ruck. And right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you say that, but... Let's picture the individual who lives in the middle of the United States where they're not going to have a beach front. 
get yourself on a trail do some trail running with these boots uh, you know you want to find a, a terrain that is not blacktop concrete you want to yeah. find something that gives a little bit so your muscles get used to running on a uneven soft or a different type of surface so your body is prepared for that because that's all that's out here i mean we're looking out our window right now it's all beach soft and hard sand yeah but i mean if you're in the middle of uh farmland hey find a pasture yep and run out there because that's that's going to work pretty well i think absolutely just just getting miles with these boots on uneven on different types of terrain will definitely carry dividends when you get to soas Okay, so staying on the topic of physical fitness, someone else asked, aside from training for a good PST score, what are some good exercises or workouts you would recommend to be physically prepared for SOAS? All right, to being a being a Navy SEAL, you know, everyone thinks, you know, it's you got to be this super big and muscular individual to to do things and carry all this weight and do all that. Most team most Navy SEALs aren't like that they're in good shape they have um good cardio are able to maintain a certain pace for a long time are physically strong and you know durable within their muscles so what what i'm getting at is you don't need to be a bodybuilder or a, a crossfit superstar to be able to be a good navy seal operator mm-hmm. right we want to see individuals who are Let's just talk this way. The probably the people, a lot of people ask me, "Hey, what type of workout should I be doing?" You should be doing high reps, lighter weight. You don't need to be, you know, doing single rep max bench press squats, right? You need to be doing high reps, lower weight. You know, probably not even over your body weight. That's what you want to be doing. Um, but know that you're gonna, there's, you're being, you're being trained. You're preparing yourself for the worst case scenario where you would have to, you know, potentially drag your teammate out of harm's way, right? And your teammate can weigh anywhere between 150 pounds to 250 pounds. You need to be able to move that weight. But in preparation to do that, you need to be able to continue and go at a certain pace with a certain type of strength, which leads to high reps, lower weight, right? If you need to move something heavy real quick, you'll be able to do that but well i've i've seen guys training before team guys and it's nothing like the training i've seen when we tell guys to get ready for a good pst so knowing that these candidates their their first step is is blowing away a pst not you know looking like captain america for a mission overseas right that's a whole different level of fitness they can right. do that when they get this far but in the beginning when they just need to impress you know, a SOAS board with good PST scores, what are they looking at for exercise? Some people prepare themselves and prepare for a PST for SOAS. That's the wrong way to prepare. You prepare for the PST to take the PST to submit with your application. Once you submit your application, you need to start training as if you're an endurance athlete, right? Like I said, high reps, low weight, um, not a marathon runner, but being able to run four miles in 28 to 30 minutes, you know, maintaining a pace, um, being able to do a hundred straight, perfect push-ups, right? That gives you, okay, my muscle flexibility, all my, um, repetitions are in good form. I have a good condition of my body. Um, because the, you know, a lot of the evolutions you do at SOAS and at BUDS are high reps, repetitive movements let's look at log pt a lot of shoulder strength a lot of uh legs leg strength so working your lower body is very important because like i said running is every everywhere you go you're running you're going to be doing log pt you're going to be doing uh races so making sure you have a strong lower body and strong shoulders is very important prior to coming to psoas and the big thing is making sure your body you know you're healthy you don't want to overtrain and hurt yourself because you're not stretching enough, right? What I'm telling individuals is stretch prior to, stretch after you do your workouts, just so your muscles have a time to cool down and you're not getting hurt. So big things are you're training for a marathon without being a marathon runner, um, high reps, lower weight, and you should be focusing on leg strength and shoulder strength because that's 90% of the type of workouts you're going to be seeing at SOAS. 
Yeah, and for the PST, they can use um, physical training guide on SealSwick.com yep. to get them ready. Uh, once they, they knock out that great PST, then they can focus on the SOAS training, which is a bit of a different kind of training. So how would you rank the uh, or weight the requirements, um, the PST, the letters of reference, university, et cetera, of a SOAS package for an invitation? What's most important? So the first thing the board, uh, excuse me, the down select panel, which is the SEAL officer community manager, the first thing they're going to look at is your PST score. Um, you know, over the years, we've had much more competitive scores. Now they've starting to get a little bit lower, but we're still seeing a very competitive score somewhere between the 700 and 800s comp score. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? That's we're looking at, you know, a nine minute, uh, 500 yard swim, a 90 plus push ups, 90 plus sit ups, 15 plus pull ups, and a 930 mile and a half run. Yeah. And I'll just interject here that if you go on sealswick.com, we have a PST calculator and the PST calculator will give you that composite score and tell you where you are. And there is one specifically for officers. It's a different yep. set of standards. It's higher standards. So use that PST calculator for officers, plug in your scores and you'll find out where you are and, and how much you need to improve. Right. And, you know, the, the thing we're seeing most is guys and gals, their run times aren't good, but also pull-ups. When, when you do your PST for your application and you submit it, the first thing you're going to do if you get invited to SOAS is a PST. So you better ensure that your PST is accurate to what you submitted, right? Because yeah. quality, assurance, uh, quality assurance isn't always up to... You know, up to standard when you get to SOAS because at SOAS you're going to have one to one ratio in uh, with assessor to candidate. So they're going to be watching every push up, every pull up, every sit up, um, and they're, it's really important that you're doing good form and practicing this good form prior to coming to SOAS because they're going to discount the reps that don't meet yes. form, right? Yeah, and yeah. potentially you could get dropped from SOAS if you get if you get checked by a, an. Um, you can get dropped from SOAS if you're doing improper form. So if you get hit several times on doing something incorrectly, mm -hmm. you could potentially get dropped and get sent home. Yeah. So and we've seen that in the last SOAS. Don't candidates. deselect yourself by right, exactly. having crappy form on your, on your, you know, curl ups or, you know, your, your, uh, push ups. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And, and even with the pull ups, right. So there's, um, e so back to the question you're saying, right? So PST is very important. That's the first thing they're going to look at. Um, GPA that's, that's very important to have a, a, a strong GPA, but the board understands that a mechanical engineer GPA and an economics GPA, if they're the same, you know, mechanical engineers usually have a harder workload, right? right. I was an econ major and I had buddies who were mechanical engineers, we had the same GPA, but they had a much harder workload than me. Granted, you know, I, I shied away from um, my focus on academics sometimes because I was focused on athletics. But just know that uh, if you have a 3.0 mechanical engineer GPA, that's okay. You don't need to have a 4.0. If you have a 2.0 economics GPA, I would have a little concern. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cuz unless you're a division 1 superstar athlete and it you know fell along the wayside of, you know, not studying all the time because you had to focus on your team and your team came first, um, the board will understand that. So there's a lot of things that play into your GPA. So but having a strong GPA, you know, 3.0 good to go, right? And, and the degree kind of matters. Degr so degree kind of matters. It's there isn't a specific degree the community is looking for. They're yeah. looking, they're specifically looking for. Okay, you picked an, you picked a degree, you stayed with it, and you succeeded and earned that degree. Yeah. Right. So that's something that they're looking at. But specific degrees isn't uh, a primary thing they're looking for when they're looking at an application. Um, so PST, strong GPA, and probably another one is having a you know having a background in something um you know 
having a background in something, whether it's in sports, in extracurricular activities, doing something outside of just academics. And what we, what I like to call that is building your brand. So w along with your, in your SOAS application, you're going to submit a resume. And this is basically a brag sheet about you, the candidate. Hmm. So the more things you do outside of school or outside of work that gets added to your resume, that makes you look a more enticing candidate for SOAS. Yeah. So doing other things that interest you is important to do and it helps build your brand as a candidate. So if you're random example, if you're at Notre Dame and you're an NRTC candidate and all you're doing is NRTC, you're you're wrong. You need to be doing something outside of NRTC, whether it's playing a sport, doing some sort of club. Um, I'm not saying go walk on Notre Dame football, right? If you played football in high school, but Hey, if you played football in high school, maybe there's a club sport. Maybe there's something else. The, the whole point is to have that team environment that you're always, the teams is the teams, the seal teams, you're working along men and women serving, and you need to be used to this team environment. That's why it's so important to maintain that prior to so as so at college do things that involve teamwork. Yeah, I've heard the Commodore t often talk about team ability being a, a crucial attribute yes. in SEALs. Yes. And, and in SWIC, too. And it, and it starts in your it starts in high school, it starts in college, and continues on. If you choose to go SEALs, it continues on in the teams. Yeah. I mean, hence teams. Makes sense. So those are the priorities, then, for a package. Okay, so uh, we got time for one more today, and we're going to have to have you back because we got a lot more questions. But last one for today: um, What is the best way for OCS candidates to compete with Naval Academy and ROTC candidates, given the lack of military experience and background that they may have? All right, so OCS, OCS candidates, it's it's sometimes difficult for those um, applicants because. You know, some some of them don't have any military experience at all, whether their parent, mom or dad served or their grandparents s served. You know, some of them don't have that luxury where Naval Academy ROTC, they're thrown into military lifestyle right away. Once you get to school, hey, you're part of the military, you know, learning how to march, learning how to salute, learning how to make your bed correctly and wear the uniform properly. OCS candidates don't have that luxury and they're not going to get that luxury until they actually go to officer cadet school in Newport, Rhode mm -hmm. Island. So some things they can do. Um, one, first off, OCS candidates, you need to reach out to me. You can get my point of contact at the Seal Swick website or it's um, andrew.dow.ctr at socom.mil. That's a good way to reach me. Um, but you find that my email on the Seal Swick website sealswick.com. Right. Um, but the reason I say you need to reach out to me is for a couple things. One, I have a, uh, a seal officer email distribution list. Um, this is a, a list I've been collecting since I started doing this and it's all current candidates or current applicants who are interested in going the seal officer route. I send out announcements about different opportunities for OCS ROTC, uh, candidates, some of these announcements will um, post, will notify you of upcoming webinars that I host. I host about six a year, and these webinars go through the SOAS application. It goes through NSW 101. We talk about, I get guest speakers on, um, some senior officers, junior officers, senior enlisted, uh, junior enlisted to come on and talk about officer enlisted relationships and their tough and um, some of the challenges they faced as SEAL operators. Um, but it gives OCS candidates an opportunity to learn about the community ahead of time. And it also tries to balance the, the playing field with their Naval Academy and ROTC teammates. Teammates. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, so it, yeah. it because our specifically Naval Academy, they have seals on the yard, and the yard yeah. is the campus. So mm -hmm. they have you know a uh, an officer and an enlisted, and sometimes even a, uh, another officer on the academy grounds that they can reach out to f as a resource. Our OCS and ROTC do not, so that's why we started these webinars for them to have a touch point and a place they can go to one talk to uh, a Navy SEAL 
me or talk to some of my special guests that I have come on, but it also gives them an opportunity to talk within, within, each, within each other um, and create their own social network like the Naval Academy has. It gives them an opportunity to say, hey, John or Mary, are you from Colorado? Oh, me too. So it gives them a good common area where they can meet and potentially build friendships and training buddies yeah. to get prepared for SOAS and to ask their questions and bounce it off one of each, one, each other. Um, so that's that's this distro puts out those announcements with the webinars. We also host an RTC OCS exposure weekends here in Coronado. Um, those are by invitation only. You register and then I notify you if you get invited. And it's basically modeled after the Naval Academy SEAL screener. And what we do is run you through some challenging evolutions for about 24 to 26 hours of hard uh, evolutions that you may or may not see at SOAS or BUDS, but it gives you an opportunity to see, hey, one, is this for me? Two, what do I need to work on? And yeah. it get, prepares you for SOAS. Uh, so don't worry. Well, let me say this, though. Don't worry about the military part. You're not... The whole SOAS staff understands that you have no military background or knowledge of the military. So you're not going to be graded on poor military bearing or poor... Um, uh, the way you wear your uniform improperly. That's all. They understand that you're going to learn that after SOAS because OCS candidates don't go to OCS until after they've been selected and been told that they're going to BUDS. That's when they'll go to OCS. So they go to OCS after SOAS while the Naval Academy ROTC have been through. And before some of, BUDS. Before BUDS, correct. Yeah, right. Um, and another thing that they can uh, work on is most of our OCS candidates have their degree already. So they have graduated and are, you know, in the corporate America or working in the public sector, stay active, continue to do things that you would do that, you know, surround yourself with challenges, whether it's, Hey, go, go to your local gym and join the club, um, swimming team, or go to your, go continue to stay active and do sports or do types of extracurricular activities outside of your work so you can stay active and stay engaged because you need to have that competitive competitive edge when you're at SOAS and you need to maintain that prior to so you don't get lazy after you graduate yeah thanks for that um, yeah. I want to put in a quick plug uh, for Andrew folks the only way you're going to find out all this stuff other than just hearing what we have to offer quickly here on the podcast is to go to sealswick.com Check out the officer accession uh, page. You're going to see Andrew's uh, name and email on there. Contact him so he can tell you about these things that are going on that are meant to help you. Um, so you can get on that, that email list and we can let you know what's going on and you can explore the community from there. I appreciate you coming in today. We're going to do this again because yeah. um, we got plenty more questions. But I'd like to thank you, folks. That was Andrew Dow, our SEAL program uh, officer programs expert. I'm Scott Williams, and this was the only easy day was yesterday. There's nowhere to hide in Hellwick Jets. If you've been skating through bugs so far, you will not do so any longer.